So we ended last class right here at the cell wall that prokaryotic cells do have a cell wall. So we listed it eukaryotic and yes, they have a cell wall. No, not all eukaryotic cells have cell walls. Our cells don't have cell walls. Plants do though, some fungus do. Um, but prokaryotic cells do have a cell wall. They are structured completely different, but it's still a cell wall. And it's made of a structure called peptidoglycan. And we left off last time saying of the cell walls, about half of all bacteria out there have what we call as a gram-positive cell wall, and about half of the bacteria out there have a gram-negative cell wall. Gram-positive cell walls are thick, it's just like a super, super thick wall. Gram-negative bacteria have a very thin wall. It's this. Um, but because about half of them have a thick wall and about half of them have a thin wall, it's one way to help determine what kind of bacteria it is. We can narrow it down. And there is a staining procedure that we will go through um, that will show bacteria as purple if they have that thick cell wall. And we call them gram positive because the stain is called a gram stain. And they will show up as pink, officially they're called red. They will show up as pink if they have that thin cell wall. Now, as I said before, the cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan. Now, what peptidoglycan is made up of, and I'm too short to like point stuff. It is repeating units of NAGs and NAMs. I do not care that you know that what NAG stands for or what NAM stands for, as long as you just recognize NAG and NAM. Um, but it's almost like the bricks that get put together and assembled together to make a brick wall. These are the bricks that assemble and make the cell wall. And so they are stacked up on top of each other, top to bottom. They sit there and attach to each other left and right, front and back. I mean, this is a super fortified thick wall, or thin if they've got a thin one. But it's just these repeating units of dams and nags, and they're all attached to each other. They make a nice, strong wall for the bacteria. Now, as I said before, if a bacteria is considered a gram-positive bacteria, it has a very thick cell wall, so it's got a lot of peptidoglycan. It's got lots of bricks. It's like the super, super fortified wall. So this part here is the cell wall. Still has a cell membrane, still has a phospholipid bilayer, but it's got a very thick cell wall. Some of the things that help it anchor to the cell membrane um, are what are known as tachoic acid and lipotachoic acid. Lipo just means lipids. It helps, kind of gives it a little stability and it helps anchor the wall to the membrane that's right below it. But what's nice is none of our cells have tachoic acid in it. And the majority of cells and none of our cells in our body even have cell walls. And so the peptidoglycan or these tachoic acids that are sticking out are all alerts for our immune system of this thing is foreign, it shouldn't be here, we need to get rid of it. So it's another thing that can trigger our immune system. Sixties, I should say about half of all gram-positive bacteria have another structure inside this cell wall and it's called mycolic acid. And I'm gonna talk about mycolic acid in not just lecture but in lab as well as we look at different kinds of bacteria. But mycolic acid, even though it's got the word acid in it, it's not an acid, it's a lipid. <laughs> but it has this like extra lipid protection. It's almost like it coats the wall in this lipid. And part of the function of that is it helps it survive desiccation or drying out. Bacteria need water just like we need water. Without it, they die. And so if they can prevent themselves from dehydrating, good for them, which means bad for us. So they have this lipid waxy container or coating on the outside that just helps them you know, not dry out as fast. Now, why we talk about it so much, because we'll talk about some of the bacteria that have this lipid. Again, it helps them survive. Good for them, bad for us. Uh, but to know if a bacteria has this particular um, lipid, this mycolic acid in it, we do something called an acid fasting, which we'll talk more about 
comment up really soon. Um, I always call it acid fast because it's detecting the acid, which is really a lipid. Detective lipid, they are harder for our immune system to kill. One of the most commonly known bacteria that has this mycolic acid that causes diseases in humans um, is, am I just going to have a brain fart? Um, tuberculosis. I was like, mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's called mycobacterium. I'm just going to write it out. Mycobacterium is the species, and it's because it's got that mycolic acid in it. But it's mycobacterium tuberculosis. Super hard for our immune system to get rid of it on its own. Even antibiotics are really hard uh, to kill tuberculosis bacteria. So again, good for the bacteria, bad for us. Gram negative bacteria have a very thin cell wall. They have a very thin peptidoglycan layer. But they have something else that's great for them. Because you're like, oh, thin wall, easy to kill. Uh, it'd be great if it was that way. Um, but they have an extra cell membrane. They have two cell membranes. So this solid kind of orange brown section right here is a cell wall. They have the normal cell membrane, but then they have like a bonus extra outer cell membrane. So for an antibiotic to get in and kill one of these gram negative bacteria, it has to get through past this membrane, this wall, and this membrane to be able to get in and kill. So they are the hardest ones to kill with antibiotics. They're also the hardest for our immune system to kill as well. And one of the things that make them not just hard to kill, but also cause more serious problems for us, meaning they're more harmful because they cause more severe diseases, is that in this outer membrane that only gram-negative bacteria have, is that they have something known as uh, LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Um, just means, yes, it's, you know, it's got a lipids, but it's also got multiple sugars in the structure of it. But in that lipopolysaccharide, that structure has what's known as lipid A. And lipid A is an endotoxin. If you have a gram-negative bacteria that's causing an issue, and your immune system recognizes it, and your immune system does what it's supposed to do, it kills the bacteria. As that bacteria breaks down, because it's now just died, as it breaks down, it releases this endotoxin into our bloodstream. And you're like, oh, bacteria dying, good. Ah. But it's also releasing an endotoxin that's going to cause some of the symptoms of diseases. It's going to cause fevers, it's going to cause inflammation, um, and depending on how bad it can cause shock, it can cause blood clotting, um, you know, vasodilation, um, it can cause lots of issues. So gram negative not only cause some of the most severe diseases, they're also the hardest to get rid of. And unfortunately, they're also becoming the most resistant to antibiotics as well. Now when we do that gram stain to know if it has a thin wall or a thick wall, um, they show up as pink, like they show up as pink. You're gonna see them in lab, they're pink, but officially they're called red after they do a gram stain. This is just showing the comparison, gram positive bacteria, super thick cell wall, and then just a normal cell membrane. Gram negative bacteria, super thin cell wall, but two membranes that stuff has to be able to get through. Now, the bacteria do have cell membranes. I'm gonna put, yep. <laughs> yes. Actually the same as one of our cell membranes. It still is a phospholipid bilayer where it's got the little heads with the two tails and they form that bilayer. And it does mostly the same as what our cells do. So everything you've learned about um, in A&P classes and biology classes, bacteria cell membranes do about the same thing. Um, they're still gonna have, you know, be the guardian to allow things to go in and out. They've got these little proteins, um, transport proteins that allow things to go in and out, whether it's waste products, food products. Um, it's selectively permeable, meaning not everything will get in. Um, it allows in what it wants to get in. But one of the unique things that a cell membrane can do for a bacteria is it can make ATP. It's not made on our cell membranes. 
Which organelle did you guys list up here makes ATP? Mitochondria. Mitochondria is, you know, the mighty, mighty mitochondria makes ATP. That is just way too advanced of an organelle. Prokaryotes do not have mitochondria, but they're still a cell and they still need ATP. So their ATP gets made out on the cell membrane. So it's kind of a unique feature. They don't have mitochondria. Cell membrane makes ATP. Do some of that other stuff. It's still going to allow things to go in. Uh, other things not. Um, different types of transports. It's a little bit of AMP review. Different types of transport that can go across that cell membrane. We've got passive transport and active transport. Passive processes or passive transport just means no ATP is needed to move these things across the cell. So it usually means they're usually a lot smaller or they're going from a high concentration to a low concentration. So small enough things can just make it right through those phospholipids, no issues. Other things may need the help of a protein channel or a protein carrier, and that's called facilitated diffusion. If you didn't have any idea what the word facilitate means, it means to help. If someone's a facilitator and you're like, oh, well, they're a facilitator, they're a helper. Uh, facilitated diffusion just means diffusion with the help of a protein. Um, and then moving water across from high to low is osmosis. This means it requires ATP. It's usually because it's moving bigger molecules or it's moving molecules from a low concentration to a high. So you're trying to shove things when there's already just lots of things. And they don't want to go there. So you need energy to push them through because they don't want to go. When A and P, I think you guys hit up on um, the sodium potassium pump. Um, it's one protein channel that our protein carrier that moves both sodium and potassium, both against their concentration gradient, meaning they're pushing it in areas where there's already lots of them. And so it requires the use of lots of ATP. Group translocation just means you're moving a group of stuff across the membrane. It requires energy to move a lot of stuff. Structure, and it's an outside structure of a cell that some bacteria can make are something known as endospores. A different color. No, not all bacteria can make them. Anything in the genus of Bacillus, and it's a genus, so I underline it, or Clostridium. The two lines. So anything in the Bacillus genus, anything in the Clostridium genus, these bacteria have the ability to make an, uh, an endospore. It's really an extra outer protective coating that they only make when conditions are unfavorable. And if you're a bacteria, things that are unfavorable for survival is too hot, maybe it's too cold, maybe it's too dry, Maybe there's radiation, like UV light. Maybe there's some certain type of chemicals around. You know, anything that's just not a wonderful growing environment, these things can make this extra outer protective coat on them called an endospore. And ultimately, they go dormant. It's kind of just like our trees will go dormant in the winter. Seeds will go dormant in the winter. And they just sit there and just wait until conditions become favorable again. If it was dry, now they have water. If it was cold, now they're warm. You know, I'm like, and when conditions become favorable again, they will germinate, just like seeds will. Well, so will bacteria. And I'm like, they will start to grow. So this is super advantageous for a bacteria, which means it's really bad for us. Because these bacteria, if there are chemicals, this could be bleach even, if there are chemicals around, that's not favorable for a bacteria. They can go dormant. And so instead of dying, they just go dormant. And then when the bleach is gone, um, they start to grow again. So these become very, very hard to kill. And the problem is lots of bacteria, between these two genus of bacteria, there are a lot of bacteria in the Clostridium genus that cause a bunch of really horrible diseases for us. And we'll 
talk about them later this semester. It's really only one bacillus that causes um, issues for us, and it's bacillus anthracis, which is the anthrax poisoning. It's bad. It's hard to kill. Um, clostridium, because I think this is my next slide. Um, some of the diseases in the clostridium genus can cause tetanus, botulism, gangrene. I mean, these, these are not good. These are deadly uh, diseases, and they're really hard to kill. One that I didn't list up there that you may already be familiar with, and you really are probably only familiar with it because you always shorten the clostridium to C and didn't even realize it. Have you guys heard of C. diff before? I'm gonna be like, yes, oh my god, I hate it, whatever. I've heard about it a ton. So I'm gonna be like, nope, no idea. You will. Um, at some point in your career or just life, you will hear of C. diff. Now, one, Everyone has pet peeves, and I have a pet peeve. So C. diff, diff is not the species full name. It's officially called difficile. <laughs> and so it annoys me that we shorten it, but I get it. It's just easier to say, oh, they got C. diff. And oh, they have C. difficile. Um, underline it, it's still genus and species. So if you never realize C. diff, what the C stands for, C stands for clostridium, which means this is a bacteria that when conditions are not favorable, it can go dormant. So it's super hard to kill, whether in nursing homes or hospitals, which are the two places where you have the biggest outbreaks of C. diff. It's really hard to get rid of, and it causes very severe diarrhea that can be deadly, um, especially for those that are already immunocompromised. Um, and we'll talk more about it when we get to bacteria. So when we talk about things as being sterile, that means we have killed all bacteria, including those that can make endospores, because they are the hardest to kill. You can't just grab Lysol. Lysol is not going to kill C. diff. And I'm like, you need a stronger thing, some of the strongest concentrations of bleach. Um, and bleach loses its potency after the first 24 hours. So if there's a bleach solution that's like sitting around for a week and you're like, I'll use this to kill C. diff, it's not going to do it. I mean, it has to be a very strong bleach solution to be able to kill endospores. Otherwise, to kill endospores, you're always looking for any type of chemical that says it's sporicidal, which means it kills anything that can make those endospores. They're the hardest to kill, and again, they cause some of the most serious issues. So we want to make sure we get rid of them. Again, C. diff, tetanus, botulism, gas gangrene. They're a big problem for medical facilities. Oh, I had sporocidal up there. So the biggest ways, I mean, we do have some chemicals that are sporocidal. Otherwise, we can autoclave things. Um, that gets really high temperature and a high pressure. We can incinerate things, or we use the sporocidal disinfectants. Made it inside the cell. Uh, other things that bacteria have, uh, I'm like, is cytosol, use red, inside of the cell. They have it. It's the same thing as cytoplasm. Cytoplasm just means the fluid with organelles. Cytosol is the actual fluid. And it's hanging out in the fluid inside the cell is where they find the DNA, so the nucleoid region. They also have inside their cell something known as inclusions. These are just storage areas. It's almost like they're a little, they would be most similar, so I'm going to compare them to each other as a vacuole. The job of an inclusion is to store stuff. The job of a vacuole is to store stuff. Exact same function. The biggest difference is a vacuole on the outside, it's a phospholipid bilayer on the outside of a vacuole, too advanced. <laughs> Um, so it's a lot, that outer membrane of a inclusion is a lot thinner, but they both store stuff. They have a nucleoid region, I just put nucleus, no, I can DNA is just hanging out inside the cell. Now, last class I mentioned, so our chromosomes are paired and linear, because I draw lines when I make X's, and they're paired. 
Bacteria's chromosome, they have a single circular chromosome, just one. All their information is in that one single circular chromosome. And everything in here, all the DNA in this chromosome, tells that bacteria how to live. However, some bacteria have bonus DNA. And it's found in these little circles called plasmids. So everything that a bacteria needs to survive is in this one single chromosome. But they can have like little bonus circles of DNA. Not all bacteria do, but some bacteria do. It's just like bonus DNA they have. It's not needed for survival, so it's not essential to the bacteria for their normal growth and metabolism, but it's still DNA. And so this DNA may contain some information that's beneficial for the bacteria. Um, it's not uncommon that the DNA in these little bonus DNA plasmids contains the information on how to be resistant to antibiotics. It's like, oh, that's a really good thing to have if you're a bacteria. And it's these little snippets of DNA that if you've got two bacteria, here's one bacteria, here's another bacteria, they can, they look like little, um, they can join together by one of those little conjugation pillows. And the little plasmid from one bacteria can go into another bacteria because they're small. You know, bacteria can't lose its entire huge chromosome, but it can lose, you know, be like, oh, I've got some extra, and it can move into another bacteria. And so we know these little plasmids can move around a lot easier, that even for us, we can use them for our own benefit with genetic engineering. We can find out what DNA is in here. We can duplicate the bacteria, and we can pull and move plasmids around. But it's good for the bacteria. Bacteria do have ribosomes. Do you guys remember the function of ribosome? Maybe it's probably up there. Makes what? Function. So same organelle. Structurally, they're a little smaller in a prokaryote than a eukaryote, but does the exact same thing. I need my clicker so I don't have to stand here. I don't know if I needed this. This still talks about those inclusions. Store stuff, don't care. Uh, bacteria do have a cytoskeleton. still very much the same. Just like our skeleton gives us shape, it gives us support, it gives us structure. Same thing for a bacteria. It helps gives it shape, gives it support, gives it structure. Look a little different, but does the same function. Oh, bacteria, I know one of these slides I have up in lecture as well. Because of their cytoskeleton and their cell wall, they do, bacteria do have a very specific shape. Like each bacteria is very specifically shaped for that bacteria. And because we know different bacteria have different shapes, we describe the shapes of the bacteria to help us identify what that bacteria is. So there really are three basic shapes of bacteria. There are coxa shaped, which is circular, a bacillus shaped, which is a rod shape. I know. And yes, there is a whole genus of bacteria called bacillus. They're all rod shaped. It's nice. Um, but not the only ones that are bacillus shaped. It just means they're rod shaped. So anything coccus, they would just be perfectly circular. A bacillus, they're longer and skinnier. But there are some variations of these bacillus, these rod shaped bacteria. Um, one, there are some bacteria, they're not perfectly round. Like I just drew a circle and I didn't make it very circular. Um, they're not perfectly round, they're a little kind of plump, so they're not truly a rod, but they're not really a circle, they're kind of in between. So we smush the two words together, we smush coccus and we smush bacillus together and we call it a coxobacillus. It's still technically a bacillus because it's not round. It's just like a really short rod. Vibrio, and I think I've got a picture of this coming up. 
just means that rod is a curve. Just makes a V, which I was like, ah, V for Vibrio. And the third shape is that bacteria can be spiral shaped. And sometimes it's like full on spiral, like the old telephone cords, or sometimes it's just like a quick little twist. This up in lab too, because we will be using these descriptions all the time. Again, you guys this semester are going to be growing bacteria, staining bacteria, and looking at them underneath the microscope. And you're going to always have to tell me what shape it is, because that shape really helps determine what kind of bacteria it is. So it's either going to be coccus, coxobacillus, bacillus. Um, those are really the three we're going to see this semester in lab. Depending on what you guys have growing in you, you may see some pleomorphic. But I don't think any of you are going to see any Vibrio growing in you this semester or any Spirillum or Spirochetes. Um, because again, we're going to use you guys as our biggest test subjects this semester. I expect you'll see Coxus, Coxobacillus, Bacillus. And again, pleomorphic, we only find one pleomorphic one in us. Um, routinely, that's like a normal flora. Um, so we'll see. Maybe you'll find it, maybe you won't. Uh, we also like to describe how they are arranged or how they like to hang out. Different bacteria do hang out in different groups, um, always. Like each species of bacteria likes to hang out in different types of arrangements. So sometimes we'll see the bacteria and they're just always by themselves. Like we only see them, they're never really touching anything else. And so we just call them singles. They're just hanging out. Sometimes we see them only in pairs. So you can see that this bacillus is only hanging out in pairs. That bacillus is only hanging out in pairs. We just list it as pairs. We don't have to list it as diplo or anything. We just got those. They're in pairs. Um, some of you may see some paired cocci this semester. Again, just depends on what bacteria you pick and what's growing in you. Um, some bacteria like to hang out in chains. We are going to be testing you guys for uh, the bacteria that causes strep throat. So if you guys are a carrier, you might see some in chains of cocci. Um, other bacteria, we can see some that are hanging out in chains um, that are the rod shaped. Some like to hang out in groups of four. Some like to hang out in big, huge groups. Some like to hang out in huge things called clusters. And I always like the ones that are in clusters um, that are cocci and they are uh, gram positive, so they're purple. Um, it's because they just look like little bunches of grapes everywhere. Um, and you'll probably see a bunch of these this semester. Sometimes we see rods that are always hanging out in a V pattern. Not as in like the rod is a V shaped, but they always hang out in pairs and that pair always makes a V. Um, we say it's a V shaped. Some will stack up on top of each other called a palisade arrangement. Again, lots of different ways that bacteria like to hang out. Um, in this semester in lab, when we describe our bacteria that we see, we're always going to want to say, all right, well, they're gram positive if you see purple or gram negative if you see pink. Um, they're cocci or they're bacillus, and we want to know the shape and we want to know how like, they like to hang out. We're like, ah, well, this is a gram positive cocci and it's a cluster. Um, that right there will narrow down the bacteria and what it is like immensely right there. We'll have a really good clue on what it is from just that. Now, eukaryotic cells. So I'm going to skim through this a little faster um, on different organelles that eukaryotic cells have. And I have skimmed through a little faster because you guys have been learning this forever and ever and ever. But doing some comparisons. So eukaryotic cells, some of the external structures they have. Um, we already talked a little bit about some of them. Um, they do have external structures. They do have some organelles like flagella. Um, some bacteria do have glycocalyx structures. Um, they can have cell walls depending on the cell. Uh, they can have, I don't want to say slime layers. That's really a prokaryotic only. Um, but they do still have cell membranes. We already went over that we listed cell membranes just like bacteria do. Um, some of the organelles, they have that cytoplasm, nucleus. Um, they've got ribosomes, cytoskeleton. Um, the nucleolus, they've got chromosomes inside of there, you see all things will be listed. They've got endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria, chloroplasts, flagella, cilia, um, the cytoskeleton, it's got the microtubules, microfilaments, all of that in there. We listed them all. These are all things that are way too advanced right there for prokaryotic cells. So prokaryotic cells 
do not have a Golgi apparatus. I mean, that is way too advanced. Prokaryotic cells do not have endoplasmic reticulums. Way too advanced. Prokaryotic cells do not have lysosomes. They do not have vesicles. They don't have centrioles. Or else am I? Chloroplasts they also do not, but some can do photosynthesis and they have something similar to chloroplast. Microtubules, say yeah, because they do have a cytoskeleton. Nucleolus, if they don't have a nucleus, they don't have a nucleolus. And they don't have peroxisomes to help break down um, toxic forms of oxygen. They have other enzymes that do it though. So again, I'm going through this because as we talked about some of the prokaryotic things, we also compared them to the eukaryotic things. Some eukaryotic cells do have flagella. They move in a whip-like fashion in a eukaryotic cell. They move in a boat propeller fashion in a prokaryotic cell. Eukaryotic cells have cilia. We listed it. Purpose of cilia in a eukaryotic cell, we generally, in our body, we find them in the respiratory system. And their job is they beat back and forth like down this picture, um, and they just move stuff across the cell, like mucus and dust particles. Um, some eukaryotic cells are completely covered in cilia, like this. These are usually ones found in water, and they can use that cilia to beat back and forth and swim. We, we don't use that, though. Prokaryotic cells don't have cilia. Their closest thing that visually looks the same is fimbri. Uh, on eukaryotic cells, our cells still do have carbohydrates on the outside of them. It, one of its main function is a signal reception. And we'll talk a little bit this when we get into the immune system. Our cells have carbohydrates, just little, little carbohydrates that stick out on the outside of our cells. And our immune system recognizes those, those carbohydrates as like, oh, yep, I know what that cell is. I've seen those things before. That's a normal cell. I'm not going to attack it. Well, and I'm like, it's you know, different variations of those that bacteria can have that our immune system doesn't recognize that it would attack those cells. Eukaryotic cells, they can have um, fungi, certain algae, plants. If you're a eukaryotic plant, do have, do have rigid cell walls. I was going to say, yes, eukaryotic cells can have a cell wall. Our cells don't, but other ones can. Some protozoa and a few algae. Um, and all animals lack cell walls. But we all have cell membranes. And I think this just goes over all the things. If you were looking, you could have looked ahead at your notes too and like, look at all these different organelles that are listed on there. Um, these are all different things that eukaryotic cells have. And these are all organelles that prokaryotic cells do not. So prokaryotic cells, way simpler, way simpler. These, you know, they just don't have all these different organelles. But they still have to be able to do different things. I shouldn't say that. Prokaryotic cells have a ribosome. Um, but they still have to be able to survive, they still have to be able to reproduce, and they still cause us lots of issues. They just don't have all these advanced organelles like we do. Um, some other things, um, they don't have the nucleus, there's the nucleus review, um, they don't have the endoplasmic reticulums, um, the Golgi apparatus they don't have. Do you guys remember what the function of the Golgi apparatus is? even based on the pictures? Does something with protein. It can. And what else can it do with it besides store? Because they usually will take proteins that were made in the rough ER, because it's those ribosomes that make the protein, and the proteins go to the Golgi apparatus. Some of them get stored in there. Some of them get modified in there, but they get repackaged and ship out. And I always think of the Golgi apparatus as like a big distribution center. Things go there, they get rearranged, repackaged, and then shipped out on other types of semis to go where offer needs to go. Um, and so same thing. Proteins go there, get reorganized, reshipped out. Um, some of them get stored there until they need to get reshipped out. 
Um, the lysosomes, do you guys remember the, the role of a lysosome? I always like to think of lysosomes as Lysol. They sound alike. They're the cleaner uppers. <laughs> so they break stuff down and they clean up the cell. So if there's like dead stuff, broken down stuff, they just help clean it up, get rid of it. Vacuoles, I mentioned already. Similar function to inclusions, storage. Vesicles are just there for transport. So sometimes they are called the transport vesicles. They're like the little taxi cabs of the cell. They just move stuff around. Or I guess no one uses taxis, Ubers of the cell. Mitochondria, we already mentioned, makes ATP. Way too advanced. All the ATP in a prokaryotic cell is made out on the cell membrane. Ribosomes, they make proteins, just a little review. Cytoskeleton, so there, gives it structure, gives it support, gives it shape. And then my one slide on the whole domain of archaea. So if you remember last class, we said all living things are grouped into one of three domains. There's a bacteria domain, which we focus a lot on this semester. There's an archaea domain and a eukarya domain. You guys have studied eukarya domain organisms because you guys are in the eukarya domain. Um, we're going to focus on the bacteria domain this semester, but we just now for really talk about the archaea domain. It's a whole domain, tons and tons of living organisms and genus and species that are found in here, and we never talk about them. Um, main reason, they don't cause us any human disease. So do we care about them? I mean, we care because they're living organisms, but then like we don't really care because they don't cause us any issues. So why care about something that never causes us issues? Main reasons why anything in the archaea organism or domain um, don't cause us issues, these things live in extreme habitats. So these things are the things found at the bottom of the ocean at the deepest trenches. These are the things that are found in the hot springs. They love boiling temperatures. They can survive boiling temperatures. They're found in hot springs. They're the ones found in Yellowstone that makes different, you know, hot springs so pretty. Um, they can survive super salty environments. So when they used to say, ah, the Dead Sea, because nothing can grow in it because it's so salty. These guys can. The Dead Sea is not dead because there's archaea organisms. Which means if you pull these things from their habitats and put them in our body, our body's not boiling temperature. Our body's not super salty. Our body does not have that deep, you know, that high pressure found at the bottom of the ocean. These things are not going to survive. So it's like we don't care about them because they don't cause us issues. Um, we care because, you know, they're living organisms. Um, now, archaea, the whole domain, all the cells in here are prokaryotic. So they're very simple organisms. They have simple cells just like bacteria, same kind of cell. Um, it's prokaryotic. But a couple differences, their cell walls, if they have them, are not made of peptidoglycan. They have cell walls, it's just structured a little bit different. But otherwise, they still have the cell membrane, um, just like that bacteria, and they have most of the other organelles that bacteria do, because they're prokaryotic cells. So my one slide to talk about archaea. It's like, we care about them, but we don't really care about them. That's where I'm ending. Nine more minutes, and I'm going to lecture for nine more minutes, guys. Because I'm going to see how far we can get. It's the farther we can get in this PowerPoint, hoping to get it finished up next class. So the next, this next PowerPoint, it's differences, different, different types of microscopes, different types of staining, because we are going to be staining bacteria in lab. It's just kind of like, how can we view these different organisms? What are some things that helps us view organisms? What are some things that help us classify organisms and eventually ID it out all the way down to genus and species? And even how do we write genus and species correctly? It's all in this part. So we're going to talk about microscopes, staining, taxonomy. That's figuring out um, the order of organisms and classifying them. So some things we do in our lab, some things are done elsewhere because we just can't do everything in one semester. So a little review of the metric system. Uh, I care about these things. Uh, is just, just two different tables, different ways of looking at them. 
So because this is called microbiology, we are looking at very, very small things. And so some of the most common um, metric system units that we're going to use, uh, I know I have milla on here, but honestly, the majority of the stuff we're going to see and talk about this semester are going to be in the micrometer size or the nanometer size. Now, a micrometer size and the symbol for micro looks like a backwards U, like a backwards lowercase u. That's the symbol for micro. It's 1 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. So it's 1 1 millionth the size of a meter. And the bacteria we look at this semester are going to be in micrometers. So we, any of the bacteria we talk about, we'll always describe them in micrometer size. You'll see it throughout the textbook as well. Now, we are going to magnify the bacteria in lab a thousand times their size. But bacteria are measured in micrometers. So even though we're going to magnify it a thousand times our normal size, these things are still really, really tiny. They're still going to look really small, but we made them a thousand times bigger. Viruses that we talk about are even smaller than bacteria. And so viruses are always described using the nanometers. So that's one billionth the size of a meter. So bacteria generally in the micrometer, viruses generally in the nanom nanometer. Oh, it's hard to say. Generally, when you're looking at eukaryotic cells, like your own cells, that's usually in the millimeters, um, which you don't need to magnify it a thousand times. And one of our labs this semester, you'll be able to actually see a comparison of your cells, your eukaryotic cells, and their size compared to a bacteria size. Now, some general principles of microscopy. Let's see if I can get through at least this slide. One is wavelength of radiation. So a lot of it is what kind of light source are we using with our microscopes? And the idea is with wavelengths, the smaller the wavelength, the better the resolution, or the better the image. The smaller the wavelength, the better the image. So there are different types of light sources. Um, the microscopes we are using in our lab, we use visible light. We just flip them on, regular visible life. Um, but there are microscopes that use UV light. And then you can even see x-rays, give even better images. This is why we use them. The word magnification just means making something appear larger. We don't actually make it larger. And when students a lot of times will use that word, they're like, yeah, we magnified it. We made the bacteria bigger. We made the bacteria appear bigger. We didn't magically make it a thousand times bigger. We just made it appear a thousand times bigger. Now, resolution, and actually, I, I think I define resolution in lecture too when we go over microscopes. Um, resolution is the ability to distinguish two close objects. Now, generally when we talk about resolution, we're usually talking, is it blurry or is it not blurry? It's like, you know, how good a focus is something. Um, but officially, it's like being able to distinguish close objects. So, use red. Hello upstairs. So, I used to have a really bad eyesight. I had LASIK like a year ago. It was amazing. Um, so I used to have really, really bad eyesight. Um, and if I took off my glasses um, and I looked on the board, I'd be like, I think, I think there's a little red blob up on the board. Um, I, it was really bad. And I'm like, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I see a little bit of red on the board. I would not be able to tell if it, I had super blurry eyes. I would not be able to tell that I just drew, like, I don't know, like 12 dots. I would not be able to distinguish each individual dot because it would just look like a little reddish blur up on the board. So good resolution means, it's in focus enough, um, you can distinguish every single individual object. That's good resolution. You can distinguish between every single individual one. Bad resolution is it just looks like a colorful blob, a little colorful blur. And you're going to do this in lab in like a week and a half because um, you only have one lab next week. Um, when we get the microscopes out, right away you're going to be like, I see something purple. Um, and I'm like, yeah. 
and you'll see a big purple blob, but until you can actually see individual little bacteria, you're not in focus yet. You don't have good resolution, but you're close. Um, and so your job is to, one, you know, you're really close when you can start to see colorful stuff, but then you need to get it in that perfect focus, that perfect resolution where you can, if you wanted to, you were not going to, you could account every single bacteria that's in your little field of view. Is, I'm trying to think of how I have it worded. It's the difference between the object and its background. The contrast is really the difference between the object and its background. And the more difference, the easier it is to see. Now, to show kind of good contrast and bad contrast, um, this is looking at sperm underneath a microscope, but two different kinds of microscope. This is looking at sperm underneath a microscope under what's called the bright field microscope, which is the one we use. We just turn the light on and look at it. But sperm are very pale. And so when you have a very bright background and very pale organisms, it's really hard to see. But we have another kind of microscope that we have up in the lab off to the side called a phase contrast, where contrast is even in its name. Um, it creates contrast. It makes one object darker whereas the background becomes lighter. And so that difference in the coloring makes it easier to see. Now, we only have one phase contrast microscope upstairs that's off on the side. Um, you guys don't have those. So for us, for you guys, to create better contrast is you guys are gonna stain your bacteria. Bacteria are almost clear. So for you to find bacteria underneath the microscope without staining them, it's like needle in a haystack. Um, so we're going to stain them to give that contrast. I think as far as I'm going to go today. Let me see if it recorded.